traditional galets. Um, one of Gerlach's good friends, Emile Danko, which I'll mention later, remember the name, was the only Belgian scientist to remain out of all that applied. Um, on the left here we have uh, an American, he was the ship's physician, Dr. Frederick Cook, some of you will know the name. Uh, he had claimed to reach the North Pole first, um, before Peary. And on the right we have Henry Hartowski, he was from Poland and the geologist on board. Um, Cook actually joined later in the expedition. Um, a doctor, or many doctors actually, there were three doctors that were hired and subsequently lost, either pulling out or, um, or uh, there was one that just couldn't, couldn't go, but two pulled out due to, uh, they, they thought the expedition would have issues due to organisational delays and inefficiencies um, in the planning. But here are some of the officers on the deck of the Belgica, and here I put um, just a, a slide in, it's got many uh, flags on board, the, the crew that were assembled during the time that that crew was changing, that the manifest was changing up until the day that they sailed. So people were pulling, uh, joining and pulling out all the time. Um, the girl ended up pulling people from different countries. He had Romanian on board, he had Polish, he had Norwegian, uh, Belgium obviously, American. Um, and there was no one language that unified them all, it was a polyglot mix. And so the girl has tried to make a virtue out of necessity and portraying it all as a grand experiment in internationalism. Um, they did have a plan, unlike Sharko, they had a bit more of a defined plan for their first trip, and it was to sail early in the summer down to the Antarctic Peninsula, where we are now, um, and chart that area, and then continue south down through the Bellingshausen Sea into the Ross Sea area, and the Gerlach plus three others planned to spend the winter uh, at the Cape Adair area in Victoria land um, and the Belgica would sail north and over winter in Melbourne returning the next summer to pick them up. His plan from there was to sledge to the South Magnetic Pole. That was their plan. So, the Belgica sailed from here, Antwerp. Anvers in French, Anvers Island is just off our port. So we will sail up the Numai Channel, we'll have Anvers Island on our port side and Bunky Island on our starboard side. And they left August 16th, 1897 to Great Fanfare, here's the ship on the river Scheldt. This shows their route out of Europe south. Now, the day after they left, they had engine trouble and had to call in Ostend, just here in Belgium, and they were there for about a week. Um, so they limped into, into the stand, and two sailors quit as a result, and the doctor quit. So a good start. Um, nevertheless, uh, they, they continue. I just threw this slide in. This is a ship called the Mercata, and it's in the stand. Um, I put it in there because it's a museum ship. If you're ever in the area, visit it. It was designed by Adrian de Gerlach later in his career and built in Scotland. Um, but it was a uh, a thir the first training ship uh, for the Belgian merchant fleet, it's a beautiful ship. Um, they did continue south, so they were delayed one week already, straight away. Um, at that point, actually, the, uh, at the Gerlach sent a telegram to Frederick Cook asking him to join the expedition to replace the doctor who quit, and uh, that's how Cook became involved. But they, uh, they called it Madeira on their way south, they continued past Cape Verde, eventually turning hard to starboard to head for Rio de Janeiro, picking up Cook there. And here are some photographs from Rio at the time from the expedition. Uh, the next port of call was Montevideo, down further south. Um, and this is in Uruguay. De Gerlach in Montevideo dismissed his cook, Le Monnier, for insubordination. Okay, so crew troubles continued. Le Monnier was ousted, and they brought a new man on board, a Swedish replacement, um, but he would have a very, very short tenure on board the ship as he became ill as soon as they left Montevideo. Montevideo. As they continued south from Montevideo, their plan was to enter the Magellan Strait and call it Punta Arenas. So after they entered, they passed the first and second gullet, made the call, 
Minto Arenas at the time was just a boom town there. It was about 5,000 people or so. Um, they arrived there December, early December, December 1st actually, and they continued to have a few crew problems. Of course, he had to let his sick cook leave, but he also fired five sailors because they were incompetent. Um, this did create an issue as there were no suitable replacements in town. There's only 5,000 people. He couldn't find any, and he accepted that he had to continue on south and leave Punta Arenas heavily undercrewed. Uh, he turned his galley over to the ship's steward on board, um, who stuck his hand in the air and said, yes, sir, I can cook. That would be a mistake. Um, so they continued south uh, into the archipelago of the islets of Tierra del Fuego on their way to Ushuaia. And here is the track. Ushuaia is just over, over here. So they call them Ushuaia, but the delay after delay had meant Gerdash started to change his plans for his overall expedition, and he came to accept that they might, might just have to spend their first full season on the Antarctic Peninsula and not venture out to the Ross Sea. Um, his change of plan was also motivated by Ushuaia's off, uh, sorry, Argentina's office, uh, offer of free coal in Ushuaia. So they picked up free coal um, for the expedition. It took him two weeks to bring it all on board, so a lot of coal. Um, so that was uh, that's now three weeks of delay, um, plus another w uh, week of delay trying to find replacements in Punta Arenas, four weeks of delay. Um, as they left the Shwaya, it's right here, they sailed along the field, just like we did, and we passed um, a, there's a farm on the North Shore, Harbourton Estancia, and it was here that they ran aground for the first time. Um, so they were really, I mean, there's a sandy bottom, so there's no real danger, but they were stuck. So they had to dump, jettison out most of their water supply, um, which would obviously mean another delay. So they, they, they did that. Um, they continued on, but it meant they had to make an unscheduled call here at Staten Island to take on water. So that was another week's delay. So that was a five weeks delay. Um, yeah, just bad news. But, so you can imagine that they were really excited when they eventually came away from Staten Island and entered the Drake Passage. And that was on January 14th. They headed south. So a little bit late. Um, there were 19 men now, 11 officers and scientists, and eight seamen. So undermanned. Um, but on January 20th, they sighted the South Shetlands for the first time. So they were exceptionally excited. It was in this area here. And January 21st, they grounded the ship again. Um, this time they freed her without trouble, without um, getting rid of their water supply, which is, which is useful, obviously. Um, the ship continued on south. They hit a few more rocks, as you do. It's an old ship, but it's very, very, very strong. Um, so they were completely unscathed and continued on. The next day, though, they got a, a bit of a rude awakening and an introduction to the Antarctic. And just before I tell you that story, I'm just going to mention a few nautical terms quickly using some visual aids. Uh, here are holes in the side of the ship. These are called scuppers. They are designed when the big waves crash over onto the deck of the ship. The water can drain freely back into the ocean. And here's just an older example of the same thing, scuppers. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is the log line. Um, the log line is something that is let off the back of the ship to measure a ship's speed. When it has knots tied in it and an equal length, they let this float off the back of the ship and time 14 seconds often um, and then count how many knots were let out on the line in that 14 seconds to give the speed in knots. So that's a log line. It's a thin line. It's a no thicker than your little finger, it's usually made of cotton. So when it's wet and it's cold, it's not the strongest line in the world. So January 22nd, they run aground a couple, they've seen the South Shetlands, they run aground a couple of times, they were all excited. They were coming into the area and they encountered a big storm. Um, waves were crashing over onto the deck. Anything not tied down was being washed overboard. Um, there was a sailor on board called Carl Augustus Reinke, Reinke Island. He was a very brave soul. He was dashing around on deck and he was clearing the coal that they'd taken on in Nishwai from the scuppers because they were blocking them and the, the, the deck was taking on water. So he was rushing around and clearing that. Um, at about 3 o'clock that afternoon, Roald Amundsen 
and Dr. Frederick Cook heard a death-defying scream, rolled out and dashed down into the engine room, thinking that there was an accident there, as a common place for accidents. And Dr. Frederick Cook, looking astern, realized that Carl Augustus Heinke had been washed overboard and was floundering in the water. He was a young, he was a Norwegian uh, sailor, young sailor, um, quick-minded. He sought out the log line at the back of the ship and grabbed hold of it to stabilize himself, himself and stop him from going under. Now, the log line's not very thick and it's not very strong, um, but he held fast. Um, he was becoming very cold very quickly, but he managed to get the, uh, the float at the end of it, tucked underneath his arm, so he was safe for the time being. And the men rushed to help. Um, the point, George McCoy, the second in command, the captain of the vessel, was extremely brave in offering to pass a thick line around his waist and be lowered over the side of the ship into the water to help save the young man. And that's what he did, but when he hit the water, he immediately sank underneath the ship. Um, the men had to pull him back, coughing and spluttering, half drowned himself um, back on board. That obviously was, was not going to work. Um, the other sailors had been reeling Reinke ever closer to the ship, but they were extremely gentle because they were very concerned that this, under the weight of this man, the line would just break and he'd be gone forever. Um, and by this time, they'd got him alongside the vessel. Uh, they were preparing another sailor with a line tied around his waist to just go over the side and pass a thicker line around Reinke. But as they were preparing to do so, he became so cold he couldn't hold on any longer and they watched him drift away in the waves and they couldn't do anything but, but watch this young man go under and drown. And they stayed in the area for a couple of hours searching for him, hoping um, that he was to never return to sight. Um, so it was definitely a rude introduction or a rude awakening, I should say. Um, later on in the voyage, uh, they named Bunky Island in honor of him. Um, so at half mast the next day, they made for Hughes Bay down here. Um, this was the area that uh, John Davis and his sealing gang made a historic landing in 1821 on the continent. Um, they began their first scientific surveys of the region here. 